Hello guys and welcome back to the Winter Preliminaries for Europe. I'm joined by Professor Robert Wing of Hearthstone. How's it going? Uh, before anyone gets freaked out, this is not another cosplay thing. I will not be. This is not a Rob Boss thing. So, uh, no, you know, you don't go to school for eight years in Hearthstone and get a degree to not be called Professor Hearthstone. Uh, jokes aside, it's been interesting to see, though, that the uh, tavern heroes and come, kind of some of the underdogs are the ones that are they're doing the teaching today, right? They're out, out in force letting uh, everyone else know that they can really play Hearthstone really well, and it's been a joy to watch. We've had some upsets, to say the least, uh, during this tournament. Uh, Tice has gone out, Powder... Pavel, Indoran, some big names. We have some up-and-comers. Does that excite you seeing some new faces on the scene? Well, I think every year, you know, we kind of get some new players who become, you know, mainstays and regulars. Obviously, way back in the day, some of the people who were seen as being, like, the top-notch players who are really good, you know, they're they're not as prevalent anymore. And it's kind of the nature of the game. Like, as it changes, new sets come out, changes are made to the meta. Some people are better at playing those than others. Some people adapt. And so, yeah, it's always exciting to kind of get to know who we're going to be seeing for the rest of the year, especially here where this is kind of the kickoff of the Hearthstone Championship Tour. We get to see, you know, who we might possibly even be seeing at the Hearthstone World Championship. I mean, it's an exciting time to be a Hearthstone player, especially if you're just getting into the competitive scene, because these tournaments give you opportunities to uh, get, like, big prize pots, uh, get your name out there, you know, get some exposure. So if you're a Hearthstone player want to go into the competitive scene, this is probably the perfect opportunity. Yeah, it really is. And, uh, you know, with Hearthstone, it's one of those things where you're sitting there on ladder, you're watching a tournament, you're like, I can do that. I'm that good. And uh, these kind of situations where, you know, you can get these Hearthstone Championship Tour points, compete in these open tournaments, and then get to stuff like the preliminaries uh, makes for a really great situation when you want to go out there and kind of prove what you can do. And I really love the element of all these fireside gatherings and people, you know, meeting up with these players face to face and, and actually just coming together and not necessarily just enjoying Hearthstone, but just competing, the camaraderie of, of having similar interests. So it's really awesome to see, you know, from a Blizzard standpoint. And gaming is about community, right? Uh, especially online gaming, like traditionally. And it's nice to have uh, these events where you can meet up with like-minded people, Hearthstone players, get to spectate Hearthstone as well, maybe meet some of your, the players you're fans of. And, you know, Hearthstone... Uh, and like traditional TCGs, you don't need to go anywhere. Usually you can just play from your home. So it's nice to have these opportunities where you can get in the bedroom, you know, get some fresh air and uh, go to an event. Yeah, it's great to have to put on pants. You know, usually when you're playing Hearthstone at home, it's kind of one of those things where you've got like, you know, Canna Mountain Dew, Cheetos, and you're just like, pants, that's for someone else. Uh, but, you know, hey, you can come out now. You can meet these people. And, you know, it's one of those things where you make friends. You might talk to them, you know, even after the event. I know, for example, you are very familiar with, like, Soddle and, and Raven, and you've kind of helped, like, build this British Hearthstone community to, to be really friendly and, you know, inclusive to everyone who wants to stop by. So I think there's very real potential for these fireside gatherings and kind of these live in-person events. And anyone can go to them. So if you know a fireside gathering in your location, you know, head down there. You might meet some new friends, practice partners, if you want to be become a competitive player. So, you know, that's a, an opportunity. Sometimes I'm getting some games. But we have the next match ready for you guys. We're going to go over to the desk with Frodan, Sotl, and D2. So take it away, guys. Appreciate that, Nick and Rob. Or should I say Professor Rob? Nah, just Rob. Thank you so much, guys, for that awesome check. And I'm joined on the desk with Sotl. And D2. It never gets old for me, man, to call you that. How you doing, man? You're doing, you're, you guys are killing it on the desk. Can I just tell you that? Is that okay? Sure. I think I, everyone agrees with me as well. You can keep as compliments. much praise on me as you like. That's absolutely <laughs> fine. Don't I love about it. it. I love it. I mean, you, uh, it, it's been such a fun journey so far. And I think, you know, to a certain degree, it does take a little bit of wind out of the sails. We can just go ahead and, and be a little bit honest. You know, when all of these fan favorites and these pro players are dropping like flies, you know, it's quite the massacre out there. It's, it's no one safe, right? We right. kind of say, <laughs> we, we look at a pool of 20 players and we're like, we expect them to, like, if any of these made top eight, we wouldn't be surprised. Sure. But now there's a realistic chance that none of them do. Mm -hmm. How do we actually cope with that? What are your thoughts on this, Subtle? I mean, the really interesting thing about it, about it for me now is the lower bracket is just an absolute shark pool now. Like, mm -hmm. everyone's in there. And normally, if if you feel like you're one of the top players in a tournament and you put yourself or, you know, you get knocked down to lower bracket, you at least feel like, okay, I'm going to be down there, but so are a bunch of other weaker players and I can use my skills, use my abilities to fight my way back out. I'm still in a good spot. That's not the case here, because yeah. lower bracket is just filled with absolute killers right now. What's your take, Day 2? I mean, we saw last year in the World Championships that we saw four absolute killers go to the BlizzCon, and that was pretty unprecedented, and now we're seeing basically the opposite of that. Usually it's in between, but uh, <laughs> I mean, now we're basically getting the opposite of that all the players are falling down. Feels bad, man, but I mean, we'll, we'll live through it. So you're saying the variants finally caught up to <laughs> Europe. <laughs> is that yeah, what you're wow. saying? Wow. 
the All right. well, <laughs> they, they finally got the opposite end of it. We'll see if that's the case. <laughs> <laughs> well, let, let's not let's not count our eggs before they hatch. We still have a, a fantastic player coming up here. It's Nyria from Team Liquid, bringing the Paladin, Warlock, Warrior, and Mage, which also has been banned to wrap things up. And he's playing up against a player who's playing from Russia. He's not necessarily Rus Russian himself, but he's still an unknown. He's going to be donning the Mage, Shaman, Warlock. Any thoughts, Saddle? You look a, a little bit taken aback by that, those yeah, lineups. Yeah, just taking in those lineups. Um, definitely, from from what I've seen, the the Russian players and the extreme Eastern European players do tend to favor more aggressive lineups. When I've played against uh, Russian players in online qualifiers and such, and uh, I know uh, Nick Chipper is a player that I um, saw come to Gfinity with a very aggressive lineup. Mm -hmm. um, so things like Face Shaman, I would expect the Warlock to be Zoo, um, and potentially Secret Pally certainly makes a lot of sense to me. Um, but the the kind of pensive look on my face was uh, about the Mage Band from uh, yeah. Hallmark to Nyria. Uh, I was just wondering what you think that was aimed at, particularly D2, if you have any I mean, thoughts? maybe he wants to get rid of something like a freeze mage. Yeah. When I look at these, I try to find patterns. I mean, earlier we casted Morgulod and looked like in the end he was trying to go for something that he felt comfortable with, so that was why it was a bit kind of out there. But you try to see if they're going aggressive, going for control. And as far as Nyria is concerned, I know you were kind of putting me down before, but I really want to see any Finn Paladin. It looks like he's going for a really controlly deck. Can we see any Finn Paladin here? I wasn't putting you down, man. Uh, any, any Finn Murloc Paladin is my favorite deck in Hearthstone right now, so... I would love to see it. It just, I, at the time, I don't really think those types of lineups foster the environment. However, uh, d you might absolutely be correct here. You know, Nyria is a guy who's been practicing Murloc Paladin a lot. Now, I do know that he's also told me, and this is something that I feel like I shouldn't reveal too, too <laughs> often, so it's only going to be one time. So listen in closely. He actually likes playing Secret Paladin. He Ooh. told me, he's like, I've joined the dark side, Frodan. He, he said me with wide eyes, like he's kind of <laughs> horrified at himself. Like he did some weird, like he looked in the mirror and, 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 and you know, evaluated his entire life morals and principles. He's like, I enjoy playing Secret Pal. He's like, I, I joined the dark side. So maybe, you know, when it comes down to putting all of your, your, your horses, you know, and trying to race it, you really got to put your faith in Secret Pal. And it is still one of the best decks out there for the metagame. But I would not be disappointed in the least or in the slightest, excuse me, if he chose Murloc Paladin. I love that deck. Sure, and it's a very, very brave meta call to bring to a tournament because it's a very polarized deck, right? There's some there's some decks that it just blows out of the water and some that it really, really struggles against because of consistent early aggression, but I guess oh, we're going to find wow. out very soon and straight away, <laughs> that is a Hello. Deathwing Hello. in Control Warrior. So your theory of a, of a hyper control -y lineup may be coming to fruition here. I like it. Uh, you know what? I mean, he is one of these players who Two is... Fair. Also, uh, you know, people don't really put Warrior and Nyria as like a common, uh, as a common theme, right? They think of Cho from Team Liquid, sure. his teammate. Uh, they think of Fibonacci, they think of Kit Kat still. But he's the one who's also been experimenting a ton. And he's playing up against what looks like to be an aggressive deck from Shaman. No surprises there, but the big surprise is nothing to play for two turns. At least right. nothing, obviously. And uh, Warrior is not a class that you're going to burn out with this deck, just from spells from hand. You really do need to develop a ball presence and have them not have the answers for a couple of turns to get that first bit, few pieces of damage in. Um, but like a game we saw previously, a risky uh, Ancestral Knowledge on turn two, but it gets paid out as he does pick up that one drop next turn. Yeah, this is extremely brutal, but thankfully Hallmark did pick up a pair of one drops to use on turn three, because if he had nothing now, it's one of those scenarios where, well, do I do I even continue this game? Like, right. it's like Warrior will continue to get so far ahead. Now, the other end of it is Nyria could also have nothing to play, but he's actually got a lot of the right pieces, right? He's got his early game removal spots versus drawing the super heavy end of his deck, which he wouldn't have application till later. Yeah, exactly. And I mean, Obviously, it feels good to actually get a one drop to play here. It would be better than nothing, obviously. But I mean, having nothing to play on turn one, even though you drew in turn two, it just feels really bad in the situation. And Death Lord! I, okay, I'm going to throw something out here. There's two options that just completely scream to me. The first is that Nyria could be playing a fatigue type of warrior. Mm -hmm. But the second thing that screams to me is, is there a possibility that, that, that Nyria Reno. has bought a Reno yeah, warrior yeah. <laughs> to this tournament? That is a, definitely a possibility that would explain the Deathwing. It would explain a lot of the things we're seeing, but it's one of those things you can only really read into as time goes on, and eventually a second copy of something tends to pop out and just ruin your Reno dreams. Don't worry, we'll see as this game progresses, and definitely keep that in mind. Yeah, typically, I mean, 
the way you just look at whether it's a Reno deck or not, you just look at how many of each card you have. But right. these are actually, I've seen Reno Warrior decks, and these are the cards you actually run. That Death Lord, that Doomsayer. Okay, so it okay. could be something that we, that, uh, we see here. Well, yep. there is a second bash, so it's unlikely. And in this case, Nyria might just be playing a super defensive, hyper control fatigue warrior right. style. Yeah. It, it doesn't seem like Bash is a, quite a premium enough card. If you were going to put a couple of two ofs in your mm. in your Reno deck, it doesn't seem Bash is premium enough to want to do that with. So we can probably rule out the Reno from here and just say that this is hyper control slash fatigue warrior. Yeah, uh, you know, the, the we also have a terminology within the community or within the pro community. We call it meme warrior mm. because one of the things is that there's a common joke that you can't actually kill with Warrior, you can just stay alive and just drag out the game, and therefore it's one of the process where you just wait for your opponent to leave the game, you don't actually win. <laughs> it's only your opponent loses. And that might be the condition, but we still have to see more of the deck. I mean, Nyria is one of the most creative deck builders in the Europe Pro scene. I can't wait to see more of it. Yeah, and one thing to keep in mind is that when you're a lot of times, I mean, in the past, you wanted to have those big creatures after you've been able to control the board. But a lot of times these days, the decks are so streamlined that if you just get rid of all the threats, you can just win. That looks like what Nuria is going with here. Obviously, he has a Deathwing, but looks like more removal. I'd be surprised to see something like, a, like an Alex or a, a Theoseran here. A couple of choices off of the Sir Finley. Life Tap does allow you to deep, uh, dig deeper into the deck, which is probably what you need at that point. Right. As much as Druid Hero Power adds you some damage and a great synergy with Doomhammer, I like the, the Life Tap. Yeah, Life Tap seems the most sensible there. As you said, you're kind of tempted to take Druid sometimes when you have Doomhammer in your hand, but essentially it's just doing the same thing as Hunter Hero Power would, but only when you have Doomhammer equipped. Um, so overall, you know, Druid is a little bit weak. I think Life Tap Jet definitely the right pick there. Okay, well... He's picking up all of the cards that he would like to in the beginning of the game. I mean, he has both of his Teledrogs out, his Leopard right. Gnomes. Still has yet to hit some of the other quality cards, like that Doomhammer, which some Shamans even feel like they keep Doomhammer against Warrior early on in the very opening hand so that they can start hammering away. Will he even get to that point, though? Warriors has so much time to set up. And Hallmark can't even set up a board because of the Doomsday that's going to reset everything. And there's the Harrison Jones. I mean, oh my God. it's it's hard to call the game pretty this early, but I mean, he's at 31, now going to be 33 health on turn 7 against the Shaman, and he has a Harrison Jones. This is looking absolutely horrible for Hallmark and great for Nyria. Yeah, as much as it is our job to try and build up the excitement and keep you guys on the edge of your seat, it's kind of struggling to see a way that Hallmark can come back into this now. He did have an option to try and uh, defeat the, the Doomsayer on the previous turn, but he really wasn't protecting much of a board for the investment of burn spells that he'd have to use to get rid of it. Yeah, it's not completely over. I mean, hypothetically, Warrior could whiff on a lot of empty draws that don't do much. Um, but most likely, whatever Nyria picks up, not only is he going to be able to clear the minions with his removal, but he's also going to start developing really powerful minions on his end as well. Uh, well, we're all right on time. <laughs> that's yet another reason why it's very really difficult to build up a case against this type of Warrior. And we also saw cards like Revenge. Yeah. Uh, we also see cards like Doomsayer. So it's like, how much removal really is in this deck versus how many actual threats are in it? You know, normally Control Warrior top ends with a bunch of heavy legendary minions. But in this style of deck, I really wonder how many big bombs he has compared to the normal Control Warriors. I, would be, I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, we saw the Deathwing earlier. I wouldn't be surprised if there's nothing other than that. Just trying to remove everything nothing possible. Nothing but Deathwing. Yeah. Well, and, 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 and the Grom. Grom because see. it's removal, right? <laughs> Just Grom is yeah, removal. Yeah, Grom is removal. It's removal. Yeah, you're, right. <laughs> you're absolutely right. This, that was a really interesting decision there that time. We saw Nyria thinking really, really hard about it, whether to use the Death Spite. Because um, he could have held the Death Spite and put his opponent in a situation where if a one health minion was played, it just gets sniped down by the Death Spite. If a bigger than one health minion was played, he uses the Death Spite Whirlwind as an execute prop. Um, so interesting to me that he choose, chose to just swing away at the Despite there, equip the Fiery War Axe, but he's in a very comfortable position now, yeah. and we may see the uh, Doomhammer-Harrison Jones interaction before too long now, having drawn that card. Which happens to be perfect, because Nyria was running low on cards anyways. Yep. And in this scenario, I love playing Gromosh Hellscream. Sure, you don't get the immediate 10 damage to the face that you normally use to see close games, but in this scenario, how does Shaman feasibly remove or like you know reasonably remove this without just giving up its ability to win the game and so one of the things is like do i just ignore it and try to win in two turns 
Or do I just try to deal with it and win as the game progresses, which is even harder because Warrior can just keep armoring up. Yeah, and D2 said it just a moment ago. Grom is removal in this deck, and that's what you saw just there. Divine Shield, minion, tricky. Only had one attack to make with the weapon. Grom clears it out, leaves a massive threat on the board. And now Hallmark has to make the decision whether he thinks he can somehow race this Grom doing oh, 10 per will. turn or <laughs> otherwise... Good how, luck with that. <laughs> yeah, other, otherwise how he intends to kill it. I mean, he does have a lot of damage. He Let's does. say he puts Doomhammer with the Rockbiter and he puts 13 to the face with Lightning Bolt. Mm -hmm. That'll leave him with s seven mana the following turn, allowing him to play everything because he can just Lava Shock and lock. Correct. So... That would be guaranteed 23 damage in two turns with the upside of 26. That's still not even enough. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> he, would need to, he would need to draw the perfect card next turn, which is probably like another Lightning Bolt. Right. Uh, and Warrior would have to miss armoring up yep. in order to kill him. And it looks like Hallmark did the exact math. That's why he basically went to the rope. He was like, how much damage can I really, really realistically, with all this damage, race him? And turns out in the end, he did all that math and realized, nope, right. I can't raise a 10 damage creature on the board when I'm at 20. <laughs> so, so now his, his, his best card that he feels like he can draw is just more damage. Like, if, if he gets any other minions on board, those things really won't stick. He has to start hitting with this Doomhammer as well because it takes multiple turns for the damage to get across. Sure, Doomhammer 16 damage, but you need four turns to do it. Absolutely, and it's kind of delaying the inevitable here. I'm wondering whether the choice not to play it last turn was just a pure damage calculation or whether he was thinking about something like Harrison Jones, but I think we have finally reached the uh, <laughs> sad conclusion of this game from Hallmark's perspective, and we are going to see Harrison Jones come down and crush some dreams here. Yeah, I wouldn't be surprised to see a concede right after this Harrison Jones come yeah. down. I mean, Hallmark at this point, he's going to have to win with the Shaman after this, so as we see the second brawl come down, I mean, you don't really want to give your opponent information, even though Flame Juggler is pretty standard these days. I mean, anything to kind of throw your opponent off. I mean, Nairia is so far ahead in this game that he can actually consider the fact that Harrison Jones makes him burn some cards right now. So like, oh, I don't really want to do it right now. I quite like all my cards in my deck. It's true. He has the luxury of taking it very slow. I mean, he's at full health, effectively full health, yep. 30 HP, and we are way past the, the, the win condition usually of where Shaman's able to win it. Uh, Nairi is dumping his hand so that way he doesn't overdraw. <laughs> Look at that! Wow. <laughs> How often do you see this? That is beautiful. <laughs> Not very often. And he's going to draw basically to his hand as content and we get to see everything. <laughs> I just want to see the Deathwing BM the following turn. I don't know about you. Uh, uh, I, yeah, I would love to see it. <laughs> Will we see it? Probably not. I mean, it's one of those things too where uh, yeah, you just don't want it. You don't. You don't want to. You don't want to waste things and like potentially set yourself up for like a disastrous thing. Because if you dump Deathwing and all of a sudden they deal with Deathwing, and then <laughs> somehow. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I mean, some 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 of these aggro uh. shamans actually run removal. So some people right. like Clento have inserted Elemental Destruction, mm -hmm. which destroys the entire board AOE. But I've actually seen some hexes as well. So it's one of those things where let's just say hypothetically you don't care, and there's this. You just met the one guy who's running Hex, yeah. and then he just builds his board up and you actually lose. So, like, you know, no, no need to get too crazy with it. But I would love to see Deathwing. Credit to Hallmark here. I mean, we all expected a concede to come down, but he's still trying to figure out exactly how he can win this game. Um, so hats off to him. I, I don't personally think there is a way, but if there is, it looks like he's going to be the man to find it. Yeah, I think he was hoping for a second Doomhammer. That would have been sure. actually a legitimate way you could have argued that he had a chance because he could have gotten all that damage out one more time with the Rock Fighters, and then potentially drawn into more burn. Still highly unlikely though, he's just going to set up the Feral Spirits in defense. But that's just delaying the inevitable. Wow, double revenge here. His... Double revenge, double brawl is not something you, you see that often. But yeah, like, like we've been talking about this entire time, just all removal is this deck. And it's really cool to see, honestly. Just like such a unique deck here. and Just making sure, because in this kind of format, someone's going to have an aggressive deck that you can just yeah. shut down. And that's, that seems like the reason why he's brought it. Sure. And I also think that it's not that bad against Paladin when you have so many Whirlwind effects. If you have Revenges, you have Death Spite, you have two Brawls, you have Deathwing. Right. Maybe even a Baron Geddon that we haven't even seen. Yeah, you're almost approaching yeah. Patron Warrior levels of Whirlwinds at that point, right? <laughs> so. All right, well, game number one ends in quite a laughable one-sided affair. Nairi is up 1-0, but I mean, just because you won the first game very convincingly does not mean the series will be any easier. Uh, I mean, Hallmark, now that he has, 
the first game out of the way and that Warriors out of the way. He didn't even he wasn't even playing Paladin. Or at least the Paladin was banned, which is very interesting. Mm -hmm. So he's not playing it. Um, and I, once again, I want to revisit now that we've seen some of these decks and Nyria strategy. What, why do you think the bans are the way they are, especially on uh, Nyria's side? He banned the Paladin, even though he has decks which might actually be okay against it. Yeah, it's interesting. Like maybe he was expecting a freeze mage ban. Mm. Looking at his opponent's lineup, because D two correctly identified that that is the kind of lineup that would want to be banning freeze mage. Mm. So if he expects a freeze mage ban, suddenly he seems to be a little bit more vulnerable to paladins. Maybe we went down that line of thinking, yeah, but it's hard to say. Yeah, I mean, you'd look at the lineup. Maybe you're thinking that you know you, you can get a win against all the other decks anyway. So. You know, Paladin's the least of your worries. Maybe Paladin is something that he keeps if there's a different lineup for Hallmark. So all these things kind of go in your head. You have like a maybe a list, right? I want to ban this first and this second. And looks like Paladin was the one to fall on that list. Yep, it's a, it's a very common strategy employed by uh, most of the players at the highest level. Um, but so far working out, great for Nyria. Still want to see that Paladin, though. <laughs> it's going to come out eventually. In fact, you know, now that you know that your opponent has that lineup, I, I'm, really sure, I'm really sure that Nyria has something cool up his sleeve. Because, again, he's one of these players that really brings unique decks. Uh, in the meantime, Hallmark also has a very untraditional lineup. We haven't seen Mage from some of these unknown players, right? They're usually favoring the traditional ones that are tried and true, the Druids, the Paladins, the, the Zoo Warlocks. Um, and, and there are a couple people who, who bring something different, right? Mm -hmm. um, you know, Control Warrior and Hunter. Yep. But in this case, we haven't actually seen much of Mage. Happen. And there's definitely a few options for it to be. It could be Tempo Mage, Freeze Mage, even Reno Mages have been popping up recently. But we are back in this time with the Face Shaman again. And it looks like it's coming up against some variety of Reno Lock from Nyria. Yeah, the Siphon Soul is the really interesting card that kind of gives it away. Mm -hmm. um, although I would assume Sludge Belcher also does too. You know, you also look at what Nyria likes to do, and Reno Warlock would make sense. He even likes these Doomsayers. I was yeah. just about to say, apparently Nyria has suddenly become a huge fan of Doomsayer. If we see uh, his last deck is, in fact, any Finn Paladin, then he will just have Doomsayers in all his decks. <laughs> Six Doomsayers. <laughs> or maybe eight. <laughs> maybe he, eight if he's playing the Freeze Mage, mm -hmm. he's just playing all Doomsayers <laughs> all the time. I mean, we've seen a lot of the pro players kind of favor anti-aggro. It looks like Nyria is taking a step for this egg. No. Aggro, you're going to die to me. I like it. So how I do you feel about uh, Coin Doomsayer right now? I think he, Nyria's going to go for the more greedy play and just uh, play it out next turn. Yeah, the, the thing that gets scary about this, obviously we're sat here looking at the hands, but if this is curved into Totem Golem, suddenly your Doomsayer is a lot yeah. more fragile. Right. The problem with the coin play there, though, is that even if it does go off, you don't really gain anything from it. Like, you stop one turn, but looking at your hand, you don't have any way to seize the initiative after that, which exactly. is what the, like, that's the idea of Tempo Doomsayer. It's where the phrase comes from. It and also can be just two mana heal seven, so it's pretty right, good against right. the shaman. Yeah. Yep. That's uh, that's pr precisely what I was going to start talking about too. There is value in the fact that you have everyone attack into the doomsayer, giving you some stall, mm -hmm. because the shaman almost certainly will kill the doomsayer unless he picks up an earth shock. Right. Well, we have a way to clear right here. It looks like Hallmark's going to go for that, and probably going to play the tunnel shock out as well, since. I mean, there could be a coin Hellfire, I suppose, but obviously you're not getting rid of the Ton of Tog in that situation. Yeah. But Nyria kind of in trouble here, despite having all these defensive options. Yeah, it depends as Hallmark how happy you are with Hellfire right now. Like, if you're fine with Hellfire happening or with, you know, the taking three more damage from for Nyria by casting the Hellfire and just having a three-one in play, then sure, go ahead and play the Ton of Tog. But it looks like he seems to think that Hellfire is a little worse for him than we do, and he's going to go with the uh, the slightly less valuable minion in the Lepanome. I mean, it makes sense in this situation, right? Because he doesn't have any overload in hand, so maybe the Lepidum just does more damage at this right, point. Right, that's very true, yeah. Uh-oh. Two on the implosion with Flame Ooh. Juggler on the deck. <laughs> that is not oh, no. good. And you know what? That's oh, no. a perfect mana usage as well from Hallmark. So one game of awful draws for the Shaman is followed up by quite possibly the most nutty draw that you could ask for. Because at this stage, it's like he's got a lot of ammo. I do like this restraint, though, from Hallmark. Yeah, he is really going to respect the AoE here. Obviously, we're sat staring at the hands. Like, oh, just play your whole hand. You win next turn. But <laughs> he's scared of something like Hellfire coming down. So he's going to hold a couple of minions back in reserve. Know that if there isn't an answer to this board, he's miles ahead anyway. So he might as well play safe and hold on to some resources. Exactly. There's so much damage on the board right now. And Naria doesn't go with his engine shield master. So I imagine this is all going phase here from Hallmark. <laughs> I wonder if that's because he re realizes it's almost impossible to win from this position. So I'd rather just keep that information secret. 
just play, just maybe right. see on the off chance I can win this game, but I'll pick a, a little bit of a weaker play because Senjin is also just weaker. Like, he just gets bullied by the Totem Golem, for example. I, I don't think there's any way you can turn down this Lava Burst this turn. It's an eight damage Lava Burst that also buffs an additional Trog <laughs> by two damage as well. Like, that's, That's insane. Pretty good. <laughs> yeah, six damage from the Lava Burst itself because of the spell power, and then also you get the extra two from the Trog that's allowed to attack this turn. Obviously, it's really, really risky going into Arena, like expending this resource. Ooh. Is he um, going to take out the, the Drake here? It looks like he is. Yeah, sure. Okay, fine. I'm okay with this too. This this actually hedges bets against Reno a little mm, bit because right. you've used it for ball control instead of face damage. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, like I just feel like Lava Burst had to be cast that turn based on the value of it. And there's the Shadow Flame that <laughs> would have punished him. Yeah. It certainly would have. And now Nyria does not have a convenient way to activate that Shadow Flame. At least not yet. And it still doesn't look like there is. Yeah, just uh, power overwhelming his nothing and then Shadow sure. Flame. Uh -oh. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't work out that way, unfortunately. I mean, the good news is he can play Leroy and there's no downside, right? I mean, no whelps at all. Ha! Sweet. <laughs> Value. Leroy into concede. Oh, exactly. And I don't know what he's looking for there, but that's going to be game two going to Hallmark. So one thing to pay attention to as Hallmark gets a very quick game number two, you know, very, very lopsided games to tie it up. So it's nothing, no different here, um, is that we do know that it is the combo relock, Reno lock. So mm -hmm. that's something that's a small variation between a bunch of Warlock players. They see Reno Warlock, which is a very board centric, you know, control deck. But then they also introduced this Leroy Jenkins power overwhelming and faceless mm -hmm. combination. Which do you like better, if any? Uh, and, and can you explain why he might have brought it to the series? In a in a tournament meta, I'm a very big fan of bringing either Arcane Golem combo or Leroy combo. You know, Reno combo lock, whatever. Um, mainly because it, it kind of fits into the role where Malagos Warlocker was a little while ago, where it's the Warlock deck you bring that beats other Warlock decks. You lose a little bit of consistency against Zoo compared to a more control-based Reno deck, um, but it's more than made up for in how badly you stomp on all the other control Warlocks. Mm. Right, and it kind of goes in line with what he's trying to do, right? Typically, the OTK Warlock has more removal. Sometimes in a more value-oriented Warlock, you can't fit things like Twist and the other because you need to get more value overall into your deck. And so that might be fitting more into a style of play where he just needs to clear the board every single time. Yeah, that's completely fair, especially because if you're predicting that kind of metagame, uh, you don't really want too many like minions if you feel like you're just getting completely aggroed upon him. We see that he has Doomsayer for crying out loud. Right. That's like... <laughs> <laughs> that's see the reason why that's so, so absurd to us is that uh, you don't usually see Doomsayer in any deck that's not oh, absolute control stall oh, like Murloc. Yes. We did it! We did it! <laughs> <laughs> like Murloc. <laughs> exactly. More Doomsayers. I mean, one thing. The reason Eight why Doomsayers. Exactly. The one the reason why I thought that you know some people might be bringing any fin is because in the Gold series, which was Conquest four decks with one Ben. You saw a lot of players bringing more like Paladin for this reason that you can basically ban out one of its counters, mm -hmm. and there after that there's like one, maybe two decks that can beat it, and then you're able to kind of just cruise after that. Yeah, I, I anticipate that Nairia was plan was to ban Druid based off his lineup right, right. Yeah, choices. Sure. It would have been good against the Warlock, it would have been good against the Warrior and the Murloc Paladin. But guess what? Homer didn't bring a druid. <laughs> and so he's like, uh, what do I do now? I guess I ban Paladin. And he's just like, everyone's like, yeah, the first player to ban Paladin. <laughs> like, this is what everyone's so you know amazed about that a lot of oh, people God. do complain about the strength of Paladin, and yet no one bans it. And Nyria does actually ban it. <laughs> Congratulations, Nyria. Using common sense. There you go. <laughs> exactly. And some people might be confused about this humility. It's getting a little bit more popularity, but the reason why you have it in the deck is because it combos with that Power Mancer. Yeah. Sometimes you just want to clear the 1-1s, one and you don't want to throw away quality in certain situations, and it really helps in that particular situation. Also, it's very, very cheap. You can draw cards off a of Solemn Vigil and use it right away, but sometimes you can't use Eldor. Yeah, and, you know, there are some people who have played with a lot of tech. You know, I was watching Ponyhoff the other day, and he was, like, playing Kodo with humility. And, and it, it was because primarily he said he was playing a lot of, like, Reno Warlocks, and he just needed, like, single target removals. He just wanted another Aldor, so to speak. Uh, interesting how he texts it. I do know that Nyria 
disagrees a lot with how Kalento plays Murloc Paladin. <laughs> they sat next to each other at Star Ladder and they <laughs> argued for hours. <laughs> Interesting. But the, the the one thing you couldn't argue is that at the final end of the day, they ended at like rank 200. They climbed like 2,000 ranks. So nice. together, <laughs> when they debated, they were able to climb. But so their powers combined, yeah. By their powers combined, they make one super Ukrainian Hearthstone. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're obviously great players by themselves. And I I mean, if they argued that much, I would imagine that Nairi is not playing Dr. Boom, particularly because he has a humility in the deck. So right. I imagine that's not what he's not going to go for. Yeah, I mean, Dr. Boom is one of those cards that Klunto's like, you should run it. And I was like, eh. And he's like, no, it's really good, trust me. And they played it, they won. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, uh, you know, one of the biggest goals for this Paladin deck is just to just keep the board clear as much as possible. And in a lot of ways, it might feel counterintuitive to constantly want your minions to die, but that's the power of the anything deck. If they stay, they have more power to trade whatever comes onto the board, but if they die, they come back later for a big combo damage with a bunch of charge minions. So that's what makes this deck insanely good in the late stages of the game. That's why a lot of times people feel like only Druid, which has very fast board and, and combo clears, or, uh, or or aggro decks can really kill this Murloc deck. Yeah, and on that subject of uh, Paladin just wanting to clear all your stuff every turn, we, we talked about in a previous series how generally you don't really want to taunt Egg against Rogue with Defender of Argus because it, you use it to just be protection against Blade Flurry. I think it's fairly similar in this matchup, and you kind of want that Egg there for always as protection against the, the, the equality clears. And it's interesting to me that Hallmark this turn chose to taunt up the Egg, and he's made it a little bit vulnerable to being popped into the 4-4 form, which just helps Nyria's eventual game plan of clearing the board when he picks up an equality. Sure. You know, especially considering that he had options, right? He could have yep. done the other uh, Ghost Spider. I don't actually know the... Spectral, Spectral Spider. Spider. That's what it's called. <laughs> I'm, very, I'm really bad with the non beast. <laughs> But yeah, it looks like Hallmark was kind of reaching for that power bomb and could still go for it. If he doesn't go for it, then he leaves himself vulnerable, like he said, to having his, his spider popped and then, from, or his egg popped, excuse me, and then from there having his entire board cleared. So I, I do like this move by Hallmark, just kind of protecting his board and making it so much more annoying for Nairi to deal with. Right, and this might end up working out really well for him because there, there is probably, just based on the mana constraints, no full clear that an anything pally can possibly come up with this turn against this board. And now from here, he can just choose to develop lower theb at any points to protect his board from one further turn, and that just might, might be enough to push through a lot of pressure. It does depend, though. The later the game goes, the low theb does have le less impact because yes. you have more mana. On, nine, on turn nine, or nine mana, you still have the availability of using the Pyro and the Equality. It right. does cost nine mana total and eliminate. So Hallmark has to be very careful. His hand is also pretty awkward. He's got, I, I would say, all of his most expensive cards in his deck, assuming he's running the normal zoo. Mm -hmm. So you know, how do you deal and effectively play all this stuff? Is it time to just play Doomguard and just hope that you can go for it? Or is, do you have to play it a little bit slower, be more cautious? What do you think, Subtle? I'd probably use this turn as my lower theb turn because, as you said, time is running out on that being a guaranteed lockout of a board clear. Um, so I'd probably use this turn to develop lower theb, use the Abusive Sergeant, or possibly just the Flame Imp to generate as much power as I can, trade efficiently with the Heal Bot, depending on which one you choose to play. And then from there, I think you just kind of have to face up that probably only one of these Doom Guards is going to be able to be played this turn. Uh, sorry, this game, not this turn. Sure. Yeah. Well, he could sacrifice the other card that gets drawn next turn. Mm -hmm. Still unlikely. The good, I, the good so thing is that Nyria still had a good amount of help, though. So even though he might end up passing a lot of this turn and just play the Peacekeeper, he still could definitely come back. And he's got one of those important cards of Consecration. Yeah, I feel like that was... I mean, you guys obviously talked about talked to the reasons why you go for it, but it was absolutely crucial. He went for the Loth of there. Just try to push damage at a certain point. And if you don't do it early enough, like you said, it just goes to waste because of power of equality. And speaking of power of equality, if Nyria can pick up equality, I think he basically just steamrolls ahead because he has that Solemn Vigil to back it up afterward. But in some ways, he doesn't even necessarily need that equality because he has like a consecration with a humility. So right. effectively put like one or two damage on the board. That's is true. that really like a threat? So, you know, Nyria still is in a pretty good spot. And here's like the big thing is that you have card draw. And in any deck that requires a stall into a combo, the most important thing that they'll ever need in the beginning stages is card draw. You look at Freeze Mage, you look at Miracle, you look at the old patron, and you look at these Murloc Paladin decks, they need that card draw. And him being able to follow up Consecration with Solemn Vigil is huge.
One one problem though with using both Pyro and the Consecrate is that those are your quality kind of yes. activators. So it's really scary to just use those out here because once you draw a quality, you need to draw another activator for that later on. But I imagine if Nairi doesn't draw a quality here, he'll have to go for it because it's too juicy. I was curious with his choice to tap this turn, whether he was just going to try and slam one of those Doom Guards and just increasing his odds of holding on to the second one. Uh, it looks like he's tapping and going for a slower turn here, getting a bit of value out of that 1-2 minion that got Aldor to uh, just make himself a 3-mana Yeti this turn, which is not too bad. But there is the card you always want to see mm. when playing this deck. Quality. Uh, it's a full clear if he wants it. Yes. Well, actually, never mind. He could. It could be very scary because of the knife juggler. That's also very true. Yeah. Good catch, D2. So this is potentially a full clear, but it can still go this very, is, very wrong for him. This is actually a 50 50 to go really badly. Yep. No. Oh, wow. And that ends up being a full clear right there with a reload. On the Solemn Vigil, which one of the favorite things is to pick up another yeah, Solemn Vigil. Say, the dream is just to draw the <laughs> second oh, Vigil. Okay. okay. And it's still the same situation where Hallmark doesn't guarantee getting two Doom Guards. One is still a threat, but you can deal with one. Sure. And it's about the time of the game where we need to start evaluating what the Murloc situation is. I think it's okay. one Blue Gill, one War Leader, from what I remember. Correct. Okay. Which means you have a four damage, ten mana card, <laughs> baby. <Whoa. laughs> Well, I mean, we do have ways for Nairi to stall until then, but yeah, <laughs> looking forward to that <laughs> four damage correct. to the face. He yeah. might actually have to do it at some point if he runs out of things to do, but for now, has stuff to go ahead and play out. For Hallmark, what do you do here? I mean, it feels like these Doom Guards have been hit in his hand the entire time. I feel like he used to like, bite the bullet and play him out at some point. Yeah. Oh. Okay, so he does lose the second Doom Guard. That is painful. Flame him. Um, but yeah, I, I, I suspected that that sort of play was going to happen at some point in this game. He's chosen to take a couple of extra taps over the course to, to get himself into the position where he might keep the second one, but unfortunately it doesn't pay out for him. But this is why losing the second Doom Guard was so painful, exactly. because yeah. it's a full clear, and this would be the final point of pushing damage. Versus now, Nyria can sort of play very liberally, because even if your opponent has a charger, you're still probably going to survive. And now you can start using like anything as removal in itself or even game threatening damage. Some I thresholds that you want to pay attention to. The maximum damage the first anything can do is 22. So Hallmark's within that range. You have to take Soulfire, right? Like at uh, this point, are you ever going to get a minion to stick for power overwhelming? Probably not. Interesting Plus, that he goes for the tap. Maybe he could have just used his Soulfire right here. Ooh, but speaking of power overwhelming, that's a lot of damage. So, I mean, it was looking good for Naria. He had cleared the board, but now. Is there any way out of this? I guess he has to he go He has for to it. anything to clear to survive here, yeah. Right. Which is still fine. Yep. Ultimately, you still have board control, and you casted more Murlocs, so if you pick up a second anything, that could just be the lethal as well. That was a really heads-up play by Nyria, though. I mean, he saw Dark Peddler go come out, realized there could be a power overwhelming, and realized right away, I just need to get rid of this. Yeah. I'm ahead as long as I keep clearing his board. Yeah. I have more removal. Really heads-up play by Nyria there. <laughs> Do you really want to flame up here, man? I'm just scared <laughs> because if you start playing another one, then you're within reaching distance of dying. Well, kind of. I mean, well, I suppose. I mean, this war leader has to die, right? You can't get two war leaders out of it. Mm -hmm. Oh, actually, you could. What am I talking about? So it would be 12 damage, and then plus a th yeah, actually, it would be lethal. Uh, but what's lethal on board if there's anything? So I think you just Correct. play it anyway. Yeah, right. I so I guess to either play way. It. Yeah. It, it kind of doesn't matter, so yeah, it's one of those scenarios where now that you evaluate, you kind of have to, plus this is more minion pressure, and if your opponent had really bad cards, that would be your way to win. Mm. Unfortunately, the board clears just keep coming from Hallmark's perspective. Nyria has a nice, tidy option to clean up this board now as well, and this is, is kind of all he needs to keep doing. I think Nyria has a pretty solid read on the contents of his opponent's hand right now, based on the fact that one of those cards came from Peddler, and one of those cards was tapped into two turns ago and has not been yet played with a bunch of spare mana. Yeah, four mana remaining is pretty much everything in the deck yeah. now that Doom Guards and Lothar were played. Yeah. And now, especially if it's the scenario where it's like, well, he had so much mana, he could have just played Dr. Boom, right. and he didn't. All right, well, I pretty much expect that he has nothing left. Mm -hmm. And that's pretty much nothing. <laughs> that, that is just as good as Wisp or, or, it, or Golshar Footman. It like, gets in the way, though. It maybe holds off lethal here. I mean, you could go for a Voidwalker or Soulfire. I mean, you're tapping this turn. I mean, it's like, are you going to actually just wait it out? <laughs> no, 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 no. I mean, you could play the Voidwalker. You could Soulfire, maybe the face, maybe the War Leader, and then tap into some other sort of gotcha. minion. Is there a Charger at all left? I mean, sometimes these people run weird cards. <laughs> Randomly, Roy, right? 
Okay. That's I mean, not that's too bad. Card. Yeah. Okay. I think uh, Pyromancer and both Consecrations have gone here, and he gets the four roll. Wow. That's pretty good. All of a yeah. sudden, Frodan. Uh -oh. this, is, uh, uh -oh. this is looking kind of winnable. Yeah, anything Nary. off the top? Nary, he just needs anything. Or can you pick up something else? The funny thing is he could have Doomsayed last turn to prevent this sort of thing, but, I mean, from my perspective, I was looking at, yeah, you just go for the hero power, threaten lethal, but right. now it's coming back to bite him a little bit. You know, the fact that Nairia didn't, like, play a Doomsayer, yeah, it's pretty funny. Leon oh! Hands is huge. You know, I was wondering when he's going to start picking up some of his other heals as exactly. well. Not, not too bad either. If he picks up... Um, all right, so is he Any safe kind of from both good? The, the damage. He so he's is safe go from what 16. we see right now, but there is now the zoo can actually draw damage. There are cards that are live. The abusive sergeants, the dire wolves, those cards are live draws now. So, I mean, there's almost no reason. I, I guess you go for the doomsayer here in case your opponent puts up like a, a defender yeah. of Argus to make sure. sure that you have lethal with the uh, the anything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't think you need more cards at this point. You have anything can happen the second one. So. Right. With Let it's 12, 12 damage, yeah. that's right. Okay, so he ends up going for more card draw, more options. You never know if you need like more removal pieces for like a big defender, like you mentioned. It's not uh, card you need. That's needed. not helpful. I don't think there is a single card in the deck. So he has three, seven, eleven damage right now. So there's not one card that would yeah. find him the five. Yeah, and that is a it. big old whiff, and that is going to be game two to Nyria. The Murloc Paladin, uh, this is, again, yes, man, yes. it's such a fun <laughs> deck. And if you haven't tried it, go try it right now. Nairi can just play charge. You're just going to do yeah, it. Yeah, you can, you can yeah, one more guy okay, plus fine. blue girl. Fine, do it that way. I like it. Good sequencing as well, getting the buff. That's going to wrap up game three, giving him a distinct 2-1 advantage. Now all he has to do is win with that Warlock deck, and he will survive. Remember, guys, this is the lower bracket. So lose and you're going home. Right. It's crazy. Some some of the players that we're probably going to watch now just to play for survival, let alone to keep going in, in winners bracket. It's just crazy how the tournament was gone. But as you said, now we uh we have to have the deck with the seventh Doomsayer of Nyria's lineup. <laughs> <laughs> I'm assuming there's only one in there, because it's probably a Reno deck, but there might be eight, who knows? That is the one remaining deck eight. that has to win. You're gonna say eight. Eight. he's just yeah. he's just jammed double Doomsayer yeah, in I, Reno. I think okay. this is what he did. He said, What deck should I play for the winter prelims? And he <laughs> opened up his my collection, he said Doomsayer in every deck, and they started <laughs> building from that point on. I don't know. I like going for the Murlocs first and just put Murlocs in every deck. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> I mean, he looks look, he looks like he's in a really good position, has kind of the Reno Lock build there going against Zulok, which yep. is that's a slightly favored matchup for him going. And against the mage, almost any mage, I feel like he's favored. Reno, you can kind of play it out so that you basically heal out of range as long as you play it very, very carefully. So, Nairi in a good spot to move on. Yeah, it highly depends on what that last mage deck. I mean, we might be getting ahead of ourselves. Realistically, we might just see a Zoo versus Reno Lock first. Sure. It depends on what Hallmark feels like is his best chances are. I know a lot of people also think about the strategy of, well, I also have been playing on the stream, and realistically, this is information out there. Maybe I just want to actually just play the Zoo Warlock again, because in order to win this series, I have to win with both decks. Mm -hmm. So I'll just queue my Warlock again, which everyone knows about. Keep that mage hidden in the worst case scenario. Oh, wait, no, they're the losers. They're, they're the losers, yeah, right? Exactly. So, ah, it doesn't matter anymore. Yeah. Usually the strategy works in the winner's bracket. Case, so. <laughs> yeah. Just keep it secret from everyone. Trust me. That makes <laughs> sense. Dan's just so used to being in winners when he plays <laughs> tournaments that he doesn't consider the loser bracket strap. Yeah, that one time. <laughs> I hey, have to be Conqueror of Super JJ, man. Like, ride that forever. <laughs> I will. Actually, that's going on my tombstone. Okay, oh. awesome. <laughs> You All will right. eulogize me, right, Saddle? Oh, if you would, if you would have me to hand Here I'll do it. Here layeth a man <laughs> who played the Murloc Paladin. By the way, what do you think about this keep from Hallmark? I believe he kept the Nerubian egg, and typically the strategy for Zoo going against a control type, a control style of Warlock is you go for damage early and stickiness later. And putting this Nerubian egg on the field would really provide no pressure on the Nyria here. Yeah, really interesting. Obviously, it is a card that plays very well around early AoEs, but you know, Demon Wrath isn't very effective against your deck anyway, because you have Flame Imp, Void Walker, uh, In Gang Boss, etc. that has no effect on anyway. Um, so you're playing around Hellfire with the egg, really, but as, as I agree with you, you want your big pressure minions early. You know, put them put them on having those one copies of the removal cards that they need in their hand. If they don't have it, make sure you're dealing a ton of damage. Yeah, Reno Warlocks, or you know what, just Reno Jackson in general, because yeah. there are more than just Warlocks that play Reno Jackson. Uh, th their biggest fear is that they play Reno Jackson and they die anyways. The, and, the, and the way that happens is usually either, um, you know, 
OTK that kind of is irrelevant, like a Murloc Paladin, or there's just a board that's so overwhelming. Sure, you healed for 29, but I have like 20 on the board, so you die anyways. That's what you were talking about, building that, that tension, that pressure on the board, so even if you happen to heal a ton, I still can kill you. And it's kind of like, you know, when Handlock was in the meta. I mean, I, I'm talking to a lot of Handlock players. When they face, you know, Haunted Creeper and Nerubian Egg really early, they don't really care. They're like, all right, I'll just keep tapping. You're not actually doing damage to me. So that's basically, you know, the, the mindset. Right here, I mean, Nairia went for the coin last turn into the Zombie Tail, so it doesn't have the option of going for that Hellfire this turn, but still can, you know, sort of play on curve with this Earthen Ring Forest here and create some tension. Maybe he can Hellfire next turn. I like it. You know, the fact that he's staying on curve here, really being slightly aggressive onto the board, so that way he might not even have to use Hellfire. Remember, one of the things about Rainer Jackson is that you have one of each card. Yeah. And we were joking about two of Doomsayer, but he probably only has one <laughs> Doomsayer. But if you have one of each card, you have one Hellfire. You have Maybe you have one Shadow Flame. You have maybe one Twisting Nether, which kind of can work, but it's really expensive. So you have to be very selective with how you use your AoE. Team. That's one of the key marks of a good Reno Warlock player. Right. It naturally leads you to being greedier with your cards, because you know you're not going to draw the second copy. Yeah. You're not you know, you're not going to be in that position where Druid will just say, oh, I'm just going to use my first swipe here, because I'll probably get the second one at some point. Like, it doesn't work like that. You need to make sure that if you use a card, you're certain that you're not going to need it more later. Yeah, be greedy. He, he says we're going to be rich for a reason. <laughs> right. I mean, it's kind of his motto. <laughs> oh, no. A two wow. roll for Hallmark. Oh, okay. Let's kill it. Yep. And yeah, he could just go face here because, I mean, if there's AoE, then it doesn't really matter. Something like a Shadow Flame wouldn't. Oh, work. man. Oh, okay. What? He's going to use Hellfire. It's the more expensive card. Also, Demon Wrath doesn't kill imps or flame imps, Dan. Yep, yep. That does help. Yep, I uh, <laughs> kind of remembered that at the same time. I just think two damage to all minions because I get it off of Spell Slinger. That's, what, that's right. exactly how I get it every single okay. time. Fair enough. Yep. There it is. So Hallmark obviously is board cleared, but the one good thing for him is he has his opponent at 16 health, so he can put some pressure on. He might be able to close it out. We see that Narvia doesn't have that Reno Jackson quite yet, and doesn't really have anything to do, honestly. He can Dark Bomb, whatever, but not going to Dark Bomb the M King boss, probably. Yeah. That, uh, oh, and that's... I love I, it. That yeah. is a big boy play right there. Let's, <laughs> let's just get the Doomguard train rolling. Yeah, I love it. Nairia's just like, whoa, well, what do I do now? Because <laughs> on five mana, usually the best play is a reasonable sized minion, like Sludge Belcher, mm -hmm. if you're playing the Fugue and Stala combination. But even those cards wouldn't be anything. Look, he has to play oh, Defender Oh my Vargas. goodness. <laughs> oh, Make it Defender Vargas. Just to potentially trade into this. Wow. That is oh. uh, pretty Hall desperate. Hallmark has been fairly expressionless for most of this, but there was a very, very slight eyebrow raise at that <laughs> Defender of Argus being played onto the board. Oh, wow. This is actually really good to get these sticky minions. Now that yeah. your opponent's really far down in health, any AoE just makes your board pretty much bigger at this point. And Hallmark has a pretty tough decision to make, whether he goes face or not, or whether he clears his 2-3. He does go face. I like face. Reduce your opponent's ability to life tap into options. The only thing that's very weak against is Reno Jackson, or in the case your opponent has some Shadow Flame opportunity. But just look at the state of desperation for Nyria. He is one Doom Guard away from just getting this game completely over with. Yep, Doom Guard or uh, Chain Draws involving Power Overwhelming and something else. Speaking of Power Overwhelming, there's, <laughs> there's his Power Overwhelming Generator. Mm -hmm. That's right. One thing that was pointed the out when we were casting. One thing. <laughs> <laughs> one thing that was pointed out when we were oh, casting. There we go. Was, uh, okay, never mind. Sorry for <laughs> sorry for kind of ruining the fun there. There's a second power welding. Nah, it's plenty fun, man. <laughs> <laughs> no, I was trying to explain something, and then all of a sudden, double power welding. But uh, yeah, that is the game. It's gonna go to game five. And just like that, we were talking about how the mage deck still stays hidden. Not really sure exactly what those cards contain. Deck lists aren't given to us casters, because we kind of find out at the same time as you guys do. Uh, so what that mage deck is heavily can vary anywhere from mech mage or temple mage to a very defensive freeze mage, all with different implications of matchups. Um, and, and specifically how the dynamic changes from, you know, now that he's seen the Reno Warlock twice, but does he know that it's a combo Reno Warlock. Maybe he's not going to play around it because he hasn't seen like Leroy right. Jenkins, a faces manipulator. Maybe he just thinks, ah, yeah, he just hasn't hit Void Caller. He hasn't hit like Fugan Stalag. And it's one of those things where you just get surprised and like, surprise, you lose. And it's like, <laughs> oh, right. From a personal perspective, I really hope it's Freeze Mage because I think Freeze Mage versus Reno Lock is one of the most fascinating matchups in the game. Um, just the fine balance between how much burn the Freeze Mage can commit, like before and after the Alex, before and after the yeah. Reno comes down. Like, it's such a fine balancing act as a matchup that I'd personally 
genuinely love to watch that right now. Yeah, I would like to watch it as well because we know that Nairia is basically a freeze mage master, so he knows exactly how to play around everything that the the opponent can possibly have in you know playing that freeze mage and everything they can do. So I really like to see how uh, Nairia plays against freeze mage, having you know himself been on that other side of the coin. Let's find out. Boom. Oh, just kidding. <laughs> Gonna be a Temple Mage. Temple Mage, which is a very high impact. Uh, I think Nairia, now that he sees Mage, though, gonna keep that Reno Jackson, especially if it's Freeze Mage, has a lot of upside. But even if it's aggressive, a lot of times those Tempo Mages commit everything, and then they're left top decking a Fireball, right? They have no cards in the hand. Just pray to God, you know, put a, you know, do a little rain dance somehow. Fireball comes off the top, but in, Reno Jax can stop that entire plan. Yeah, I think there's more and more players who are coming around to the fact that you just keep Reno in just about every matchup, with the, the philosophy being that, you know, my deck is built inefficiently, and the reason for my deck being built inefficiently is this one card, so why would I not keep it in my hand? Uh, yeah. It's an argument that makes a lot of sense. Well, the thing is, when you have the Reno in hand, you're able to play the game completely differently. Right. Because you know that if anything goes bad, and my opponent kind of you know, basically tries to go face, puts a lot of damage on my face, and I can go with the Reno the next turn. Whereas if you don't have that healing, that guaranteed healing in your hand, sometimes you have to be very aggressive in clearing your opponent's board because you, be, you could be taking that damage later on. No, Rayrius doesn't want any shenanigans with Sorcerer's Apprentice. That's one of the more underappreciated cards in Tempo Mage. People look at Flame Waker, they look at Ethereal Conjurer, some of these really flashy cards that have some random effects to it. But, you know, the big MVPs are the ones that are underappreciated, like Azure Drake, Sorcerer's right. Apprentice. Those yeah. are the heavy lifters of the deck that people don't really talk about. Even in terms of the early game suite, like people are always like, oh, please don't have Mana Worm, please don't yeah, have yeah, Mana yeah. Worm. But a Sorcerer's Apprentice that sticks to the board is just devastating sometimes. Interesting Duplicate. card here. Wow. So... Tempo Mage is a, is a deck that does tend to run out of cards these days because you're kind of forced to be play um, all the Flame Waker triggers. You generally play like Double Arcane Missile, Double Arcane Blast these days um, to, to deal primarily with Secret Paladin. Um, so because of that, you tend to run out of resources quite quickly and Duplicate can become, become uh, sorry, can become a viable option. It's really interesting too because normally the secret is Mirror Entity. Yeah. And now that Nyria plays Doomsayer in anticipation for Mirror Entity, he sees that it's not. What else does he think? Well, it's probably another popular secret called Counterspell. Yes. It's not that either. So he's just gonna be like, well, what is probably duplicate? And then by then you're like, ah, crap, I've fallen so far behind on board because I played inefficiently. Yeah, you saw kind of the, a little bit of a smirk, like a disappointed smirk from Nairia, realizing that that wasn't going to be Mirren, so he couldn't clear his opponent's board that way. And kind of an awkward situation here for Nairia. I mean, he was partly thinking, okay, maybe if my opponent goes all damage to face, even if this doesn't proc, then I can just play the uh, uh, the Reno Jackson the following turn. But right now, it's just completely so awkward. What do you even do you here? If you play Reno Jackson's only healing for 13, and as good as that sounds, the, the deck isn't made for Reno to be healing only 13. Right. You heal for 13, and you would just immediately take 9 at a bare minimum yeah. if he wants to go face. So it's it's really not that significant of a heal. He's going to have to find some sort of board control play here. And uh, so interesting that Senjin is the choice. I guess if he doesn't Reno, he is scared of just dying this turn, which is the reason for the him mousing over the Senjin instead of the Twilight Drake here. What's also really scary is that Nyria th still doesn't know this is duplicate. Therefore, <laughs> you know, as he, he can't do the play, I want to stall till Twisting Nether and then be able to be saved. He still might think that might be a way to just destroy my counter spell, or with counter spell, destroy my Twisting Nether and I can't do anything. Absolutely, and options here. I mean, Doctor Boom, Turn Seven, etc. We all <laughs> we all know the meme, but that lower Theb is also pretty juicy. Oh. Oh, yeah, looks like we accidentally got knocked off. We'll just join her back in a second. Fine. I mean, we can still see what Hallmark is doing this turn. He's still mousing over his cards. Um, but that Hallmark, is, uh, sorry, that Hallmark, that lower theb is probably better served as a, a Twisting Nether stopper next turn. Um, which, interestingly enough, if he does play lower theb into the Twisting Nether turn, we'll probably telegraph to Nyria that that's not counters well. Yeah, that's actually an interesting perspective. And I know Nyria is astute enough to pick up on small things like that. So we'll see. Hallmark chooses Azure Drake instead, picks up a Arcane Intellect. That's a card that you want when you have nothing to play. So that's probably one of the worst cards you could have drawn right. at this stage, because he's definitely going to play Boom and Lotha before he needs the Arcane Intellect, unless he needs to get Spell Synergy off of things. Let's see if these five Arcane Missiles can clear out the board. It does yeah, clear out the does. entire board. That is so much damage. And Nyria can't even really play 
the Reno Jackson here gets to take so much damage on the backswing. I guess he just has to because it's, otherwise, yeah, yeah, that's yeah. the one play. It's it's yeah. it's a play that doesn't feel good, but it's the only play that lets him live one more turn. But this probably will just be delaying the inevitable at this point. And as Frodan pointed out at the start, you know the worst feeling as a Reno lock player or as a Reno anything player is to play Reno and then just die anyway. Right. I think this is time for Lothab and Frostwolf to face though. Five damage yep. to the face, <laughs> and you can't even shadow flame at this point if you play the Lothab. So I think it's just time to go extremely all in for a fault. Well, not not even that all in. Just put on the pressure on Nairi and try to close out the game. Right. It's not even really an all in play. It's just the play. This is what you do to win the game. <laughs> exactly. Actually, he could go for Lothab and Arcane Intellect and maybe pick up even more damage, potentially. Sure. Yeah, that's totally fine, too. But, you know, is, is that Frostbolt ever dealing more damage than it will right now? It's, it's very true, double yeah. Drake and buffing a Mana Worm. Yeah, so Frostbolt with two Azure Drake spell power buffs as well as that Mana Worm. That's a Fireball equivalent, so... If you have that, then... Let's see... 13, 15, 21... Ah, that's a lot of damage! <laughs> <laughs> Wrapping up the game, pretty much. Yeah, it looks like Hallmark was considering all his options, but he's gonna freeze this Reno Jackson. I mean, okay. es essentially this protects um, an Azure Drake, if you like to look at it this way. It protects a 4-4 on the board. Um, so, you know, not terribly bad, and he is locking out, you know, leaving the minion there isn't an issue because Shadow Flame can't be played. So he's locking out a lot of options here just in terms of regular trades. And is there lethal damage on the board right now? It seems like kind of a lot. Yeah, I think he's one off right now. He, yeah, he has 14 right now. But with the buff on the Mana Worm, that might be it. Uh, as long as he, it. yeah, as long as he can still do proper damage, he can. Four plus one to the Belcher, two to the Slime. Yes, so he should have it just with Arcane Intellect. Yeah. Arcane Intellect lethal. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, he's most likely going to pick up something else to buff as well. And yeah, it looks like that's going to wrap it up. So, wow. Hallmark taking down Nyria, and that is yet another pro player who has bitten, bitten the dust. Unbelievable. What do you guys and think about that? I, I mean, I'm, <laughs> I'm speechless. They're just dropping like flies, you know? These are the guys yeah. that have uh, staken their reputation on being like the, 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 the foundation of professional Hearthstone as we know it. These are the guys that we expect to be winning tournaments. But as I've mentioned before, this is kind of what the new uh, Hearthstone Championship Tour format is all about. It's about saying, you know, no one gets handouts. No one is, is here because you're famous, because you have a big stream, because you have a big organization. Every single one of you is going to have to earn it. And the, the, pe the people who play the best on the day and throughout the year will make it to BlizzCon. Guys, I think I'm really bad luck because I've knocked out three <laughs> players, three BlizzCon qualifiers while I've been casting here. So <laughs> it's th There's something in the water over there. I'm not sure what's going on at all. Uh, but, you know, either way, it's still pretty hectic to see everything go through. But th the big story here is that that's elimination for Nyria. Right. Like, a lot of times we've seen the, the losses in winner's bracket. It's like, well, you know, you can't really expect to go undefeated all the time in the, in, throughout the tournament. Uh, you might drop a series, but that's just it. And it's still pretty early. It's round three or round four of the losers. They, they're going to round six or seven tonight. So, you know, before they make that cutoff for ultimately the games tomorrow, uh, you know, this is a pretty early exit for him as well as a few other players who have a lot of notoriety. Absolutely. And, I mean, again, that, that loser's bracket, even with Nyria now being eliminated from it, is such a, a shark pool at this point that no one wants to be there. No, and, and everyone who's still lucky enough to be set up in winners isn't going to want to drop down there into that kind of shark-infested swamp no, that they have. So. Yeah, and even if you don't get to the top eight, you really want to get to the top 16 because if if you guys don't know, you actually get $2,500 just for getting to the round of 16. So if you lose at this point, getting so close, it feels really bad. Yeah, you know, ideally, again, you like to go to the uh, the, right. the Europe Championships. What's happening is next month uh, we're taking the top eight, where one person goes to BlizzCon directly, uh, and then we reset the season, and then we try again for spring and summer. We'll have three champions followed by a last call to see who can get that last spot. It's going to be really exciting. Um, but Nyria can't be one of them. And last year he was one of the people who got top four right. in Europe. In fact, he got second in the entire region. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, not not exactly the uh, story, of the ending that you would want for this kind of story, but it's beginning of a new one. I'm really curious to see how far Hallmark can go because he is a player that people don't know about. And again, you know, if all these guys who are just dethroning the establishment of Hearthstone players that people know about, uh, maybe it's time for them, the old guys, to either try a little bit harder because, you know, they, they sometimes they're not... They're not getting enough kick from the bottom. So I can definitely appreciate some up-and-coming up players. 
Yeah, absolutely. Maybe it is just a little bit of complacency. Who knows? I mean, I, I don't think so. I think behind the scenes, a lot of these guys are where they are because they're putting more work in than anybody else. Honestly, you know, 12 hour, 12 hour days of practice sessions. I recently saw Orange tweeting about how he was yep. uh, labbing with the SK boys for 12 hours a day. So this is the kind of dedication that these top level players do put in. Um, but sometime there's going to be a changing in the guard and no one gets to stay on top forever. So. Just how it goes. Well, uh, that's it for us for now. We're going to head over to Aquablad on the other side of the tavern, checking with him and see what's going on throughout the brackets and the rest of the tournament. Thank you very much, Dan. It looks like all the pro players are dropping out, but it may seem a nightmare to some. I think it's uh, the tournament of dreams for up these upcoming players, giving them opportunities you know, to get in the spotlight. And I really like stuff like that. I like new players, you know, getting in front of the camera, getting on the stream and showing you guys what they're made of. Uh, that last game was actually really good. I watched uh, most of it. Nyria bringing some awesome decks. I love seeing stuff like Murloc, uh, uh, Murloc Paladin, sorry, and uh, of course, the Fatigue-ish Warrior. But yeah, the bracket is viewable. If you guys want to see it in the link, you can see which players have survived and which players are still kind of fighting in the lower bracket to try and get that top 16 spot. If you have any thoughts on today, be sure to check out the social medias of Twitter, the Facebook, get in touch with us. Let us know what you think about this tournament and some of the players you've seen up and coming for this tournament. So that'll be it just for now. We'll have another match for you very shortly, so don't go anywhere. We've got some more Hearthstone coming to you.